let's go. Great. Great. Dinos, um, Trends in AI, uh, October edition, uh, live from Lab 42. Lab 42 had um, its first year anniversary uh, yesterday. There was a big uh, party here uh, with uh, Zeta Alpha um, visualizations on the big screen in the, in the, in the hall. Uh, and actually, it's another anniversary today. It's actually the second anniversary of this um, Trends in AI uh, webinar. Uh, 21, we started. Starting the third season strong now. Third season. Um, and everything is accelerating. So let's dive into it. I'm Jakub Zavrel, uh, founder of uh, Zeta Alpha and a uh, uh, AI veteran. And with me is uh, Dinos. Hi, everyone. I'm Dinos. Uh, I'm an AI researcher here at Zeta Alpha. So... Uh, we've prepared some exciting papers and news from the past one and a bit more of a month. Uh, yeah, because uh, we had a bit of a summer break, right? So um, in, uh, July, in in August, we didn't have anything because we were very busy having summer vacation, uh, but also um, uh, preparing transformers at work. Um, and it was quite a show. So on uh, September 15th, uh, how many people did we uh, have in uh, live in person? Uh, I think close to 100, 120. Yeah, 100, uh, 120 people in uh, Startup Village. Um, we had great speakers about um, a lot focused on information retrieval and large language models for um, uh, for um, um, representation learning and uh, yeah, ranking. Was in computer vision and robotics yeah. as well. Yeah, that was the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So um, No, I mean, maybe the icing on the cake was also the after party. I think people really enjoyed it. That's true. And um, all the videos, except for the after party, are on our YouTube uh, channel. So uh, if you're interested in uh, the talks from there, uh, check it out. Um, and um, now it's already October. So a lot of things have happened. You did a, this kind of overview of the large language model space until uh, uh, September. The end, of, the end of August, yeah. Uh, until August. the end of August, right? Uh -huh. So uh, that was quite a dynamic year. I think it's uh, fair to call this the year of large language models, right? Yeah, and it's, uh, we see contributions coming in from anywhere, open source community, of course, uh, industrial, big tech uh, applications, and also uh, academia is continuing to push uh, wherever like the fears yeah. that a large explosion of open source large language models, mm -hmm. right? So we'll see some more of those. Um, so let's start with uh, some of that news. Um, what is uh, well, this was a very interesting application. Hey, Jen, have you checked it out? Yeah, I think they have a very cool demo. Uh, and I'm sure people will be impressed if you've never heard of it before. So what do they do? So uh, it's basically uh, uh, a kind of uh, app where you upload a video of yourself and it translates to another language, the speech, with your own voice, cloned. Uh, but it also lip syncs to the, the right language. So let me show you a little clip that I recorded just before um, we started. Ciao, benvenuti a Trends in AI, edizione di ottobre. Parleremo dei lanci tecnologici più caldi, delle notizie aziendali e delle scoperte nell'IA. Con il mio co-host Dinos Papacostas e un focus sui grandi modelli di linguaggio. La loro nuova evoluzione multimodale e il loro utilizzo nella conoscenza, nella scoperta e nelle informazioni sono malvagi. Iniziamo. Right, so I can assure you that I don't speak a word of Italian. Ah, uh, so that's how you spend your summer break. <laughs> well, I was in uh, Corsica. They, uh, it's kind of a gray uh, area there, whether they want to speak Italian or French. But uh, my French is not very good, but my Italian is non-existent. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Though. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, and also uh, translate to other languages, Chinese. Chinese, uh, yeah. Yeah. Chinese, it doesn't have all the languages, I think Japanese, Chinese, uh, all, most of the Western European languages. And um, um, you picked up uh, this one, right? That, yeah, it was like very a similar. Feature now. And uh, so they're slow, slowly rolling it out to creators that they trust because, of course, uh, this voice generation is still very early on and you don't want it to fall to the wrong hands. But with trusted podcasters on Spotify, they are now, you can now actually check your favorite uh, uh, person that you follow. And maybe they speak English, maybe you don't, your English is not that good. 
you can now uh, natively listen to their podcasts uh, at your most of the native languages that they support. So, for example, uh, I've seen that they uh, showcase an example with Lex Friedman's podcast and other podcasters in uh, many genres. You can find their. Lex, kind of... Lex Friedman does not speak all the languages himself. No, I think not yet. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this is a very cool feature, and this is making content more approachable to people that are not in the Western sphere of influence. But it's also quite uh, dangerous, especially this kind of voice cloning and uh, and lip syncing. It's very convincing. Uh, it is. There was a, a scam uh, last week uh, with a CEO of a Dutch bank. Uh, and it was a Zoom call with his employees. And he was on the other side giving them like instructions in person how to transfer money to some other account. And uh, yeah. It was, it was not him. It was not him, no. Uh, yeah, I think this is why uh, this slow release of getting a few people's feedback in and how we should do it effectively is very important uh, in this stage. I heard watermarking is not that effective. Um, so, um, yeah, that's uh, very multimodal. And uh, there's also a lot of uh, language models, so open source language models. Um, so I think first we were having this trend towards bigger and bigger, right? trillion parameters yeah i mean end of end of august start of september we had the falcon 180 billion falcon 180 billion yeah uh, so, although there was not much better than the the llama uh, uh that is true two, for right? english but uh, especially for multilinguality because llama is not that specialized in many languages right. for, for, for falcon it did make a difference uh, yeah. in portuguese and uh, spanish and languages like that so um we reported before on these um, um, tiny startups uh, that some of them were just three people and they got a hundred million euro funding. That was Mistral, I think. And um, now they already have their first release out. So I think that's pretty impressive. In three months, they uh, fully built up the infrastructure and pre-trained um, this um, um, seven billion model yeah sure three people but they had uh, tons of experience and they are definitely were key players in llama and exactly other models. yeah uh but i think uh their claim is that this mistral 7 billion uh, parameter model is actually better than llama right i think it beats even uh the 13 billion llama 2 model yeah. if i'm not mistaken which is actually impressive uh they do better uh within to really go into depth of their training they did not pull out a technical report but there, uh, like people played with it. Now it's some so many platforms where you can just chat with it, and now they're already uh, clearly uh, beating some other very popular models yeah. like St St Stable Lamb, uh, Llama, MPT, and all these. Cool. And um, yeah, another company which got a lot of funding, but it's a bit longer time ago. Uh, I remember that Adapt uh, had this uh, very cool demo about a year ago. It was um, the company that boasted. Um, Ashish Vasvani of the Transformer, the first author of the Transformer paper, uh, as one of their, I think, the lead scientist. Um, they haven't released all that much yet, but now uh, in August, kind of in the middle of the summer, they launched this Persimmon model, which is uh, fully open source, Apache yeah, 2. It is Apache license. licensed and it's uh, ranking competitively to Llama 7 billion. Yeah. So that's another strong model for the community. So we just wanted to call out uh, some attention to uh, to that for those who missed it over their summer vacation. Uh, and another um, recent startup which uh, also already launched their product is Reka, uh, led by uh, Yi Tai, among other uh, people. Uh, and um, yeah, they have launched uh, not so much an open source model, but a full-fledged product, like a, yeah, basically open AI competitor with a multimodal, uh, multilingual, retrieval augmented uh and um i think it also has video capabilities which ChatGPT doesn't yet yeah so that's also yeah. kind of gotcha to open ai what, uh, did you hear anything about benchmarks is it very good uh they do benchmark but they don't kind of disclose their competitors they just say that they perform better than model a or model b that has a hundred thousand uh, context window which is kind of in the case of like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, they're not very uh, detailed or technical about it. They just say that uh, we have, uh, and also the pro the product release was very focused on. We built this uh, very detailed pipeline of how we collect data, how we clean them, and how we train models, even under constraints in uh, resources. Uh, but again, they were just in the beginning, so getting all these edge edge one hundreds is difficult uh, if you're not a 
sponsored by NVIDIA or Microsoft. Yeah, so uh, uh, very cool, these launches. Um, I think uh, shipping product is the uh, is the real proof of being a company. So uh, congrats to Adapt, Mistral, and, uh, and Reka. And we had Dao Akila from Contextual AI uh, at our workshop as a speaker. Um, so I think he mentioned this, uh, his model is also going to be multimodal, also retrieval augmented, and very good, but it's not out yet. So waiting uh, eagerly for the Contextual AI model um one thing that was announced a long time ago and uh, uh, now hyped up a little bit more with this uh, um, advertisement that open ai's chat gpt will see hear and speak finally it was already kind of in the original announcement right yeah uh, i think only for, for vision input but now they're expand, extending it to also uh, support users who are not also that able they're well able to type into the chat or right. see what the answers so speech are speech recognition speech output also speech I think. Output as well yeah and uh, do they have video no i don't think or they, they claim video. to have video not, not yet so uh, unfortunately it's not available in europe yet so uh allegedly it has been rolled out into um, uh, chat gpt premium users in the us uh, we have yet to uh, lay our hands on it but there's a good alternative, the, like with GPT-4, the dawn of uh, AGI, or what was that paper called? The uh, I think early sparks of AGI. Early sparks of AGI, exactly. There's this dawn of large multimodal models uh, paper, 166 pages. I call that, again, book, uh, but it's uh, not really a scientific paper. Uh, there's no evaluation other than very uh, qualitative and um, examples. So they go through, go through all these things, like how you can reason about images, point at images, and then um, uh, kind of have dialogue about that. Um, well, check it out. It's in our platform. Uh, and I think really, if you're thinking about applications of, um, of GPT, um, yeah, this is really changing the whole landscape. Like yeah, it's, because... it's not just a, a small like image input. Uh, it's... it's a completely different thing yeah because as they say like one image is a thousand words so if the model can understand these a thousand words just from one image then you can have really deep dialogues about them and have follow-ups with uh, new images like they showcased in the example with uh you're stuck in a situation where you don't know what to do you snap a picture asks for some feedback uh or even uh, you have an idea prototype it and make it write code for you right which would be also very yeah, good white, whiteboard the uh the application idea have the code produced well i don't believe that <laughs> entirely yet but um one that i found particularly impressive is uh, some of these um, sort of um uh, industrial application use cases so um, um they have these uh, examples here where they have objects and with some sort of defect and the chat model accurately describes the exact nature of that defect and okay i can imagine like a dent in a in a metal thing but this uh phillips screwdriver uh, screw where the uh the, the 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 screw is a little bit worn out so that the uh screwdriver does not have grip when you apply force that it is able to really describe that i found that impressive and that i think it's impressive because if someone doesn't have the technical knowledge i think even humans might not be able to recognize oh this is why my screwdriver is not yeah. working and there's tons of computer vision companies which are actually specialized in like industrial inspection use cases so i think this is another uh, real game changer um so in other updates uh, of gpt what it already had but then it was removed is uh, browsing the internet so there was some issues with uh, copyright and stuff i think they they solved that now yeah, their update now kind of uh, is more faithful to the robots.txt file within a website. So if someone asks not to be crawled by bots, ChatGPT will respect that. Right. And also they kind of uh, evolved the capability of going deeper and deeper into websites and visiting not just the first link, also getting information from the second one and uh, coming up with just one answer. Uh, of course, many other platforms also do this by now. Yeah. Um, and uh, still, it's uh, I think it, it, it is a nice example of this sort of retrieval augmented generation pattern, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, in a bit uh, for everything that's publicly available on the Internet. 
Right. So other business news. Um, well, lots of stuff uh, happened. Um, I think uh, um, I used to, uh, uh, two years ago, kind of pick up the, the AI uh, snippets of news out of some uh, some uh, uh, news sources now it's kind of the other way yeah, around right. like Definitely. news is about ai generally and there's like you you throw away the ones that are not about ai that are not significant enough um so the uh hollywood um um uh, scripts uh, writers uh strike for example that was all about ai well about money of course uh, but I think they reached now an agreement on uh, getting good uh, or decent compensation if their works get used to train AI or get modified by AI. Uh, so they stopped the strike. And um, there was this big um, uh, lawsuit between uh, Getty and OpenAI, I think so. Yeah. I don't know what happened with that. It's still in progress. But now Getty, uh, who, of course, have these huge archive of uh, images that they own the copyrights to uh, with NVIDIA launch their own uh, generative uh, um, image uh, model. Um, what else? Um, you looked at the meta uh, AI releases the, yeah, uh, the uh, last mean, week of September, right? I mean, props to them. They did a big contribution to the field with open sourcing Llama and all the technical reports behind it. And now they're trying to also benefit from the uh, development that's been around rolling it, so. it out to all the products right? yeah so they want to integrate it and i'm assuming not just the base model but all the tweaks and uh every modification that they got from the open source community as well and now they're uh shipping it into products like within whatsapp or within messenger you can uh include a chatbot into your dialogue or specifically chat with a completely made up new contact that is Maybe your dungeon or with, master or with uh, Snoop Dogg, right? Yeah, or, yeah you <laughs> can the dungeon master. <laughs> you can be it can be your dungeon master. I mean, here you have some uh, asterisks like uh, these models. Since they're still not perfectly aligned yet, maybe they're too aggressive with saying no. Uh, you want to play Dungeons Dragons, but no weapons allowed in this <laughs> run. Uh, so, still a very interesting application of AI and. and Confident that Meta will eventually get it. You want to be right? a Unix sysadmin, but kill <laughs> is not allowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think, uh, uh, indeed, Llama is out, like, uh, since uh, August or something like that. Uh, well, the Llama 2, Llama right? Is, yeah. I'm assuming that. Uh, so now already launching products on, on top of it. I think uh, Meta or Facebook is back to kind of break, uh, move fast and break things mm -hmm. motto. Uh, uh, but some very nice uh, product announcements. Uh, well, we have the EMU paper that's kind of at the base of all the image generation in the selection uh, later on. Um, in our uh, search world um, of um, information retrieval, uh, kind of big business news is that Yahoo is actually uh, finally, you could say, uh, spinning out the Vespa uh, engine, which uh, is a pretty interesting um, uh, vector and, uh, and classical information retrieval hybrid uh, into an independent company. So uh, I think Yahoo is still the biggest customer, though. Should be. And uh, I think this is also a very good move, on, move for the open source community since Vespa is so much uh, invested into it. Absolutely. Um, so congrats to Vespa on their independence. Um, in big funding, uh, yeah, I think Anthropic and OpenAI uh, have been dominating the headlines. So Anthropic uh, got this very big deal with Amazon, $4 billion uh, of investment from Amazon, kind of topping the earlier Google investments and moving them from Google Cloud into AWS. I actually read a rumor also about it that Google wants to reinvest even more money. On that <laughs> like, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see how that turns yeah. out. Uh, well, there was this other news that they are actually looking for more cash funding because reportedly all of this AWS yeah. funding is just credits. Yeah. So, uh, From one uh, pocket to the other for Amazon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, uh, they are seeking uh, 2 billion uh, new funding for a valuation of some... Uh, I think 20 to 30 billion, uh, and um, which is about as much as OpenAI. And in that, um, in those calls with the investors, uh, reportedly they said they already have passed the 100 million revenue anthropic. So, uh, uh, pretty yeah, I see Cloud now being uh, integrated into more and more platforms. Yeah. The long context, right, mm -hmm. is very attractive for some applications. 
Uh, OpenAI also still looking for investments, uh, gigantic valuation, but not always uh, rosy in AI land, especially in the hardware side, right? So uh, Financial Times reported um, earlier this week that uh, Graphcore is really not doing so well. They made about uh, not even 3 million last year and lose it, lost about 200 million per year. Uh, so right now they're heading into uh, financial trouble. Um, it's very hard to compete in the AI hardware space with NVIDIA being so dominant. All right. Um, so from the conference front, I think a lot of people from the uh, Lab 42 building here uh, are in Paris this week at um, ICCV, Computer Vision uh, Conference. And um, uh, there were some interesting site workshops. Uh, yeah, think, workshops right? and social events. Uh, I know that Hugging Face is organizing one. And from their uh, perspective, I think it's uh, one of the biggest uh, AI-related events or gatherings that has happened ever in Europe. Around I, one to two thousand participants. I saw some uh, pictures of Hugging Face uh, management walking with llamas through mm -hmm. the streets of Paris. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we'll have ICTV indexed uh, soon. I think. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, proceedings just uh, went public today. Yeah, they they are uh, in our platform soon. So just a little uh, uh, break for those who haven't heard about the Zeta Alpha platform. So um, we are building this uh, uh, tool to uh, basically discover, organize, and analyze uh, content in um, uh, AI research, uh, but also beyond in, in private data sources. Uh, and we allow you to easily tag uh, papers that you're interested in around topics uh, and then um, get really good recommendations from that and a lot more. Uh, so um, that a lot more is uh, basically allowing large language models to reason with your own data, uh, which is this um, uh, by now well-established um, retrieval augmented generation or RAG um, application pattern, where you basically first find relevant uh, context uh, and then template them into the prompt of, uh, of GPD, which is really the only way you can expect it to um, answer questions about any sort of um, um, up-to-date or proprietary uh, data. Um, so this pattern really improves factuality, removes hallucinations, and provides transparency because you can link to original um, document sources. And with that, um, we are more and more um, applying that to knowledge management uh, processes. Uh, so basically, when you have a question inside your company, and you have uh, lots of different information sources in your Google Drive, in your in your Slack, in your Confluence, in your Jira, et cetera. Um, yeah, maybe you want to uh, uh, just type the question and get the answer. It's a lot faster than going through dozens of documents. This is an example from our own development work where we were looking to um, figure out how to get the uh, coordinates of um, uh, bounding boxes in a PDF. Um, and it turned out that um, uh, someone had already researched that almost a year ago. And as we were about to rush to figure it out again, uh, we surfaced the answer from the old document. And it was a lot easier. So it saved uh, quite a lot of work. And um, uh, a little, two weeks ago, we uh, launched this um, um, same retrieval augmented generation pattern, then, but then within a particular document. So you can basically open a document. This is one of the papers we're going to be discussing in a bit. And you can just ask questions about it. So that's how we prepared this uh, webinar, more or less. Uh, get summaries, answers to specific questions, extract data table and code on the fly, uh, find related materials, and it's fully integrated into your um, discovery workflow. And I just want to tease one last uh, kind of new feature that we're about to release. You can now also do that with document collections. So with entire... Um, uh, folders or tags, as we call them, and um, yeah, have all that across many papers. I think that's going to be um, uh, saving people a lot of time in literature research and uh, decision making. All right, so um, let's dive into the paper selection for this week. And yeah, uh, I mean, as for every month, we use also our platform to kind of browse around and see what's trending and what is uh, like the main categories of work that has been done. Uh, so, for example, this is the 
visualization of the clusters for the literature that was published in the last month. Uh, we see some clusters that we've come to expect now from uh, the field, like large language models and reinforcement learning, robotics. Uh, we see some notable ones such as uh, deep learning for model fusion and uh, generative image modeling, which are... It's the first time I really see quantum machine learning. Yeah, we don't, uh, we I, don't have one paper in our selection, but... We it, don't yet, but I don't know that... There's a, a few, growing area. A few people here at Lab42 are working on that, so this is definitely trending. Uh, yeah, actually, there are two clusters for large language models, and we have a lot of that. <laughs> about <laughs> half of uh, <laughs> half of the uh, content that we have is about large language models, which is kind of representative of the whole space. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, let's uh, start with the first paper. Starting with information retrieval. Uh, well, information retrieval um, and large language models equals summarization, more or less, right? So you want to uh, summarize the search result. There was a past where there were all these specialized models for summarization. And this paper, um, yeah, it's kind of a hot take uh, that all of this work on summarization has essentially become irrelevant. Um, uh, so, um, um, what they show in a, in a user study is that basically, um, large language model based summaries created by, um, a GPT three and a half and four are so, um, uh, vastly, uh, preferred by, uh, by humans to like, uh, 84, uh, 16%, uh, uh, ratio. And in, in some cases that is almost, uh. Is, is no longer meaningful to to do this with specialized models. I mean, if I play devil's advocate for a bit, these models have been tuned to be favorable to humans, but uh, we also need to consider the informativeness and factuality. Informativeness and factuality, absolutely. So they also looked at that a little bit, um, and um, a little bit counterintuitively, they found actually, by the way, they counted hallucinations that human produced uh, summaries contain more hallucinations in some cases, especially in uh, uh, like multi-article news summarization and in uh, describing what code does. Um, so um, yeah, people introduce, especially these what they call extrinsic hallucinations, where they just say things which are generally true or make sense, but they are not written in the source material. Maybe language models are human level after all. <laughs> well, I think I think language levels are uh, models are still a little bit more likely in this sort of uh, intrinsic hallucinations where they really say things which are neither written in the material nor true. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's still some room for improvement. Um, but I think the conclusion of this paper by and large holds that yeah, the field of text summarization is now being dominated by LLMs. Um, so, um, uh, let's move to retrieval. Uh, also in, uh, information retrieval, the whole ranking problem, uh, has now been kind of, um, uh, um, yeah, tried with, with GPT. You basically give all the candidates from the first level retrieval to GPT, GPT three and a half or four. And, um, already in this paper, um, about rank GPT, um, they, um, found that it's pretty good at that. Um, that um, it outperforms existing sort of um, uh, state-of-the-art rankers. Uh, and here, Aronak Pradeep in this paper with um, others um, from University of Waterloo, they showed that with a 7 billion parameter Vicuna model, which is based on LAMA2, um, when they uh, distill that knowledge from GPT-3.5, uh, into this smaller model, uh, they are able to to beat um, uh, GPT three on half and almost um, reach GPT four performance uh, with an open source small model that you can run on your laptop with a little bit of tweaking. A little bit of tweaking and also uh, some caveats in terms of uh, how it's actually done. It's not just one pass; it's a bit more complicated to kind of get this result that is. To the state to the level of GPT-4, which is which don't currently expect for open source models. Yeah. So what you see uh, in the graph there is uh, they actually have this tweak uh, where if you want to re-rank the top hundred, you kind of do a few passes so that uh, a little bit like in bubble sort mm -hmm. can the the good candidates from the uh, from the ninety to hundred slot can can bubble up in the, the improved performance a little bit. But already in one pass the inform. Performance is quite good with this very simple prompt, right? It's just 
literally saying, um, uh, yeah, rank the passages. Tomorrow should know what to do after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, and uh, what's important to 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 um, note is that in fact the Vicuna model as is. Um, uh, had no idea about this task. Like it, it did very poorly. It, it just uh, copied the original ranking into the output. But like in language models, some GPT distillation is enough to do the trick, right? But now um, we get to the practice of search engines and um, um, with the requirement that you do um, a retrieval and ranking under one second. Well, this is very academic. Yeah. Uh, I think one re-ranking takes about 30 seconds at, uh, at the least. So not ready for production yet. Um, this is another uh, information retrieval paper uh, with large language models. Yeah. Uh, you read this one. This is very interesting. I think one of my highlights for uh, this month's selection, well, this is coming from Microsoft Research, and they are saying how extensively they're using these language models actually in production for Bing. Uh, they're co they've come up with uh, this very in-depth study of how they can be used effectively to kind of annotate queries and documents as relevant or not. Um, their main model behind this is that you actually don't want to just uh, come up with a label that the model thinks is right. You want to align as much as possible with end users because the users that searches for something he knows or they or she knows with click data basically what, or... what is actually what they wanted to find. Mm -hmm. So you want to simulate that as much as possible when you use a language model to evaluate. Uh, they have this kind of uh, comparison that for crowd workers, they usually become very cheap, cheaper than you'd have experts or your own developers dipping, digging into that, but uh, it's not really quality work. So what they do is they, they came up with this prompt that they... Uh, it's pretty common. It's not something that's very complex. But uh, so, for example, you have this task definition of you want to rank this query and document pair. This is my uh, graded relevance of, uh, range. This is the query. This is the document. And then they add some extra modifications, like uh, maybe let's try giving a role to this language model because this is GPT, their internal version of GPT-4. And they're saying, okay, now you're an expert that's ranking uh, relevance. And Another aspect that they, uh, the, another trick they call to uh, get even better performance is let's have multiple aspects of relevance. So maybe trustworthiness of this pair is uh, important or factuality or overall uh, relevance. And what they see is that, uh, interestingly enough, the model is much more hesitant to say that uh, a pair is relevant, even though in, in practice, the track annotators from the data set they said that this is actually relevant. So it seems that when, more conservative. The, yeah, when the model says it's relevant, it, it most likely is, but uh, there are many cases where the model doesn't see uh, uh, the similarity. And they did a very in-depth analysis of, of this prompting, the whole prompting setup, which uh, aspects are actually important. And as they see in this table here, uh, actually giving this role act doesn't uh, affect, the, this doesn't correlate with the improvement in uh, correlation between human uh, annotation and AI annotation. And another aspect that they tried is to have multiple, simulate multiple judges. So uh, like in these benchmarks, these data sets, we have three or four annotators and then you take the mean. Uh, they tried to simulate this with GPT, but it didn't help. But what with helped, like the uh, temperature variations, or uh, I think it, it, no. just in one go, you say uh, we have four different profiles. Simulate all four in oh, in one go. Yeah. yeah. That's... <laughs> so that's that was kind of a split a rushed, brain annotator, a, a rushed uh, uh, experiment. But they did conclude that uh, the most uh, significant aspect is uh, this multi-aspect uh, evaluation. You still conclude with one score overall, one, uh, two, or zero. But first, the model kind of reasons of, okay, it is a good result in terms of relevance, but it's not that helpful. So let's maybe lower the right. score. And what are they using this relevance judgment for? Uh, they want to basically uh, evaluate their models. Quality. So, uh, yeah, and they, right. and they go in great depth into their paper of saying, we use this daily and we have some uh, some automated checks of seeing that the, the labels that come from one day versus the next is not too different. Mm, because then, It's kind of a concept drift mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And one of the last highlights from this paper is uh, not always uh, roses here because they found that very slight paraphrasing leads to quite a significant uh, 
uh, disparity in where the final uh, uh, correlation between humans and AI lands. So everything in the prompt. In the prompt itself. Yeah. So for example, in one prompt, they'd have uh, rank these pairs from zero to two. And in another, you, they'd say, give scores of zero to two. And they'd have, that would have different performance. Right. So uh, they do claim that this is a very uh, uh, fragile aspect of this whole uh, process. But one good thing about it is that if one prompt is better than the other in one subset, they tried with different splits and they mm -hmm. saw that the the gains were cons consistent across all pairs. So, so prompt engineering is still a black art, it's, even it's, for uh, this. Even for Microsoft and even for however many of our much money they're spending into this, uh, we haven't found a solution yet. Yeah. And so other uses, obviously, uh, synthetic training data, mm -hmm. right? But um, uh, like Rank Vicuna using, uh, using this Do in Bing know? itself, that's not an option no. yet, right? Uh, all right, so um, next paper is uh, a bit more um, uh, fundamental research, you could say, or uh, less applied. Um, this uh, um, interesting collaboration between Google DeepMind and, and Meta actually um, went all the way back to Shannon and said, well, prediction, accuracy, and compression are two sides of the same coin. Uh, Shen would be proud of them. Uh, and um, they said, well, we now have these super large language models which are, which are very good at prediction. So are they also very good at compression? So basically you have a noisy channel and uh, you compress with um, Chinchilla, I think is what they're using, Chinchilla 70 billion parameter model. And then you have the same model at the uh, receiving side and you can uh, yeah, uh, uh, have a very low uh, bit rate in the, in the communication with arithmetic uh, coding. Um, and what that that makes sense, right? Um, so we saw previously with models like GPT-4, it can encode how like a very arbitrarily long prompt into a very short one that it understands, and then kind of decode it back again. And that was the 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 Shogot speak, right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's not what they did here, but uh, I think they just use use classical. Um, uh, compression uh, algorithms uh, with the probabilities that the model um, uh, gives. And uh, what was more surprising is that actually they use this as a uh, compressor for image data and audio data. So you have now completely different um, uh, input byte streams uh, and it still did a lot better than um, uh, standard good compression algorithms like GZIP. So it had no training on uh, images and audio, but the language model trained on unstructured language was still very good at compressing image byte streams. So that is pretty interesting. And they have an explanation for that, which I find fascinating, is that say, well, trans large transformer models are actually very good at in-context learning. So once you start like compressing the byte stream, you basically in context learning from the data that you've already processed, the statistical regularities of that data extremely well by being pre-trained on, on language. Because I mean, you can see the pre-training aspect of language models as compression of all the knowledge that, that there is in the, in the on the internet or the sources that they use. Yeah, but you can see it also as a way to learn about structure in general mm -hmm. and uh, repetitions and patterns and uh, you know, how you can uh, build representations. So fascinating paper, good read. Uh, obviously in this graph here, if you actually would like to use it for compression, you have to add the model size itself to the compressed data. So it's not a particularly good uh, alternative for GZIP uh, 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 yet. Um, you would have to compress more or less an infinite amount of data for the, for this to make sense. All right, um, another um, use of large language models kind of uh, nibbles at this um, fact that um, prompt engineering is a black art. Um, so this paper by Google DeepMind, uh, large language models as optimizers, um, actually tries to uh, frame any sort of optimization problem, which, is, um, which doesn't have a gradient, so you, you're not able to compute the derivative over the uh, error landscape um, and put that in uh, a particular prompt that is 
um, basically kind of a, a search over some implicit gradient. Uh, so you describe the ta optimization task in natural language, and they applied it to prompt engineering, but also to classical optimization problems like uh, uh, linear regression, uh, error minimization, or traveling salesman problem. And it basically, um, template, it uses this prompt. Um, so basically, you're saying there's an optimization problem, and you're giving a few examples of, uh, here in this case, a chain of thought prompts, like let's figure it out and let's solve this problem, and then their score on the, on the, uh, on the problem. And you're giving a whole bunch of them. Uh, and then you say, well, I now have an example, and your goal is to make a new string or new solution for this optimization problem based on these examples that you saw. That's even better. And well, in this uh, in these graphs, you can see that it is kind of a gradient search. It actually for many of these problems, it uh, sort of stochastically searches and finds a better uh, solution. Uh, for them. And um, then they applied it to prompt uh, engineering uh, with the famous uh, chain of thought example, let's think step by step, which produces a lot better solution than just giving the answer right away. And they tried this with different language model as the sort of the base ones. So they, they work with Palm and GPT-3.5 and, and GPT-4. And it turns out that they actually reached uh, an optimum for these different base models with different chain of thought prompts. And the one that performed the best was actually with the large palm model. And the, uh, the, the uh, automated um, uh, optimization of this prompt resulted in the uh, words, take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step. So taking a deep breath is very good for palm. Uh, nice paper. Uh, so uh, we already at number five. Um, enormous amount of interest in large language models also uh, for um, building agents. Um, so we've seen this whole sort of uh, explosion of um, uh, agent frameworks like Auto GPT, Baby AGI, Super AGI. And Langchain, I think a very popular development framework uh, uh, for retrieval augmented generation is also kind of an agent framework. So in this paper, um, they introduce uh, a, 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 it's a Chinese group from a company called AI Waves. Uh, they introduce a new framework uh, called um, Agents. Very intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, right? There are no claims of uh, AGI yet. Um, and uh, the paper is a pretty nice read, and it's also a good introduction if you're in general interested uh, to um, uh, get your um, 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 get your hands dirty in this uh, area. And um, it's all open source, and um, Basically, they have uh, all these different components of what's considered sort of this agent set up like a, a long and short term memory using tools, browsing the web. Um, but what they also have, uh, what many of these other frameworks don't have, is that you can have multiple agents actually kind of communicate with each other to collaborate on solving a task. And some of these agents can also be human input. So, yeah, because this is a major setback for many applications that deploy AI agents. Uh, I don't feel like it's still ready to the point where we can just leave everything to the agent. We need to kind of this this human is very AI it's not ready. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a good, very, very good feature if you want to have still some control over what's happening, especially if the task that is solving is critical. You don't want to give it access to your computer uh, or your production database without yeah i think what you see with a lot of these um auto gpt success stories is kind of yeah you it works for one case and then if you give it a slightly different case it goes completely off the rails because all of these steps the error cascades and it, yeah, it's just very hard to get keep that mm -hmm. together uh one thing they also introduced in this paper is this uh, idea of controllability through standard operating procedures so you give kind of constraints on what the output uh, path uh, can be through some rules or regular expressions or something 
And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, an interesting idea. And they launched it in August and they already have over 3,000 stars on GitHub. Um, staying a little bit in the realm of Asian, this was a, uh, also an interesting paper that came out um, uh, a little more than a week ago, uh, Reconcile which is exactly this idea of multiple agents kind of uh, negotiating with each other. So you have this uh, self-refined pattern where uh, the um, uh, LLM looks again at its own output and reconsiders, um, or um, uh, they argue about it, but then they just uh, vote on a, on a, uh, on a output. And in this uh, idea, it's a fairly simple idea. You just kind of pass the reasoning from one agent to the other and ask it to kind of iterate on that. Oh, and I think the instruction is something like convince the other agent that it's uh, that, that there's another side to this argument or something like that. It's like a town hall of agents that are trying to... Yeah, uh, trying to reach some conclusion okay. in, in multiple iterations. And... Um, there's a couple of interesting results in this paper. So um, here in this table, you see the, the individual agents on, um, I'm not sure what data set that is. Uh, um, I think it's uh, um, uh, some kind of common sense reasoning data set. And oh yeah, uh, here, G GSM 8K and, and strategy. And then you see basically that um, this uh, reconcile pattern uh, yeah, beats all these other combination strategies on all of these uh, data sets. I don't think you can see it here, but it's, it's the best score. And here, basically, the, um, uh, the uh, combination of ChatGPT, BART, and Claude is able to beat consistently beat GPT-4 on these uh, things. So I think that's a pretty uh, interesting idea. And also, if you just have copies of yourself, uh, both GPT-4, Claude 2, and Bart are able to improve by doing multiple iterations with themselves. This doesn't really matter, right? Whether the other guys in the town hall are from a different village yeah. or uh, from the same. So reconcile, check it out. Um, it's from... Um, uh, Mohit Bansal's uh, lab at the um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, now we're moving to a different topic, alignment. Alignment and the reinforcement learning from feedback. Uh, GPT 3.5 kind of popularized this uh, human feedback, which is very costly. So people have been trying to come up with alternatives, such as Anthropic that proposes uh, alignment solving by having the AI model kind of Give it his input on is something wrong, something harmful. Yeah, these constitutional, constitutional principles, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it turns out that people do want to try this out because now we have the surge of language models, so they're getting better and better at reasoning and board knowledge. So why not use their feedback uh, to solve other tasks as well? So this paper from Google Research uh, found it interesting that it's not uh, migrated fully yet to DeepMind, but uh, what they say is. Um, we can use effectively feedback from a, a generative language model uh, and train a smaller one uh, purely by comparing. Uh, you still, again, train a reward model and everything that goes with uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. But now your judge is fully comes from uh, generations from a, language, from a language model itself and not uh, human involvement at all. The so, same or, or a different one? Uh, I mean, the base model can be the same, but okay. uh, like GPT-4, uh, you just generate something, and then you either use a, a language okay. model or you use someone someone's actual human pre preferences to train this reward model. Yeah. Uh, so they try a bunch of different things, and they find that uh, some specific aspects of the prompting and the whole uh, engineering part, like uh, giving more detailed instructions and eliciting this chain of thought reasoning, it does help uh, in terms of producing a more uh, aligned model. But there are some surprising findings, such as that few shot in context learning doesn't help, or self consistency where you sample multiple times, and then uh, see if if all of the yeah, inference passes agree with each other. Uh, and they found that this actually does not make a, any difference in terms of the final model that it's showing on these uh, reward signals. Uh, but what's uh, very encouraging for this method is that uh, when comparing these over uh, supervised fine tuning, that equally 
uh, both uh, RLHF and RLAIF uh, are preferred. And as a matter of fact, when you compare one to the other, uh, when you do a human study on that, uh, they found that uh, the humans did not really clearly prefer uh, one over the other. So uh, they did find some differences in it, such as that uh, AI generated uh, feedback leads to models that are less coherent or make some more grammatical repetitions or mistakes. But in terms of uh, summarization ability, uh, more or less, it's not that. And factuality. Factuality is not right. that yeah. something changes significantly. Right. So uh, this is uh, also a, a similar topic, right? Yes, but now they're taking it kind of a step further. No, you don't even need fine tuning. All you can. Oh, without any fine tuning. Without any fine tuning. All you need actually is at inference time to have more clever ways of detecting when you're uh, saying something potentially harmful. Uh, this reminded me a lot of this uh, chain of uh, three of thoughts paper where we covered a few months back uh, and they're taking an application specifically with a, a kind of an evaluator model that goes in after every uh, number. So you number score of, basically during the decoding. Yeah, some number of tokens yeah. you create this tree and uh, you call this uh, model every so often saying, okay, is this path that I'm taking potentially harmful? And if yes, then let's backtrace a bit and start with a purely like this is purely a uh, pre-trained yeah. large language. Yeah, there's model no without any fine tuning. You know, no fine tuning. Uh, and does it compete well in, with with uh, Errol? I mean, uh, I mean, models? they use this method as a kind of way to prevent hallucinations and harmful behavior of existing models. Yeah. Uh, they don't uh, exactly compare head to head with uh, like because they, they uh, use this on Llama and they show that for Llama itself. Uh, the harmlessness evaluation goes from 82% to 97%. Uh, so they just saw that you have this model. If you cannot re do reinforcement yeah. learning because it's expensive, complicated. Yeah, but the instruction so tuning does more than harm reduction. Yes. It actually introduces all kinds of mm -hmm. interesting behaviors. Curious if, they, if that would generalize as well. Um, so um, another way of uh, reducing hallucination, kind of fact checking on the goals. Again, this is very much on the same pre in the same premise of uh, we have this language model that does something in one pass, but maybe it's not good enough. Maybe it has hallucinations uh, for question answering, summarization, anything that is uh, not your bread and butter of language models auto regressing uh, endlessly. Uh, so can you explain a little bit in more detail what yeah, they actually do here? So it's a pretty uh, basic concept. What they suggest to do is uh, first, of course, you let the model generate something. But then you use um, potentially the same model or some other model to create fact-checking questions. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of pondering on what it just said is, uh, can I ask questions out of my answer again? So for example, if you ask here in the example is uh, people that are, were born in New York, the model says something, and then mm -hmm. you get the answer and say, was this person actually born right. in New York? Was this person born in New York? Right. So you let it generate like a, a longer answer and then you use some, some kind of passage to query type of uh, prompt. Yeah, to, and then uh, you, you probe it specifically for everything you said, you claim something, right. is this true? And yeah. then what you want to do kind of is separate that aspect of generation with the fact checking pro process, because if you put everything in one prompt, the model would just see it in its context and maybe right. uh, say yes, of course. And then second step is also uh, verified by retrieval augmented. Uh, oh, no, this is all other... this is all from, from the same model. So. The model, the model itself will say, was this person born in New York? And then uh, based on this knowledge, okay. and but not conditioned on the original question. Right. So it will say, was So this, uh, would, only, this would only work for, for facts that are kind of in that the model already, yes. already knows. Yes, yeah. but the model kind of regressed and said something yeah. that it shouldn't have. I think you could easily extend it to have the verification also retrieval. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? That would be very interesting. On some sort of proprietary information, yeah. you would need that. Yeah. yeah, but in this application, they just constrained it to uh, the scenario where the model knows it said something wrong, but it kind of accidentally uh, started generating that and it was too late to fix it. But once you detect this, then it's easy to say, uh, oops, let's go back and fix the answer. Cool. Yeah. And a pretty significant improvement there. Uh, yeah, they, they show that they can beat, let's say, Llama 65, 65 billion beats Llama 2. Fine by quite a lot, right? By, by a very significant mm -hmm. number. Yeah. Very and nice. of course, you're spending more time during inference since you're doing all these passes, and yeah. Yeah, it's a trade-off. Well, reducing hallucinations is very important. Um, so let's do a fast take on this one. I think this is also one of my favorite papers of the batch. Uh, they showcase contrastive decoding, which for those unfamiliar is when you have two models, an expert and an amateur, 
and you penalize the expert when they try to say something similar to the amateur. Right. And this really only works uh, when the amateur is really bad. So you don't want an amateur that is strong enough and says good things because you penalize the uh, expert for no reason. And for example, what they show is um, when you do this kind of uh, penalization in the logins, there are cases where this really helps. And this is especially true in reasoning and also in preventing repetition from the input or from the prompt because mm -hmm. smaller models tend to do that. Uh, but for reasoning and especially abstract reasoning, this helps quite a lot. Uh, they point out a few uh, caveats, such as that, uh, as I said, the amateur should not be too strong. And also that uh, factuality doesn't really change if the model knows it, depend regardless if it's a small or big model, uh, that would not help. Mm. And they also point out that the chain of thought is very important for this. And alternatives to using smaller models is using partially trained models. So this is a very cool way of uh, improving reasoning with limited arsenal of weak or medium and tier What models. kind of computational implications does it have? I mean, is it is it just running two models side by side? It is, models, yes. Right? But it's kind of using the weaknesses of the small model to uh, kind of push the better model to be even better. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, so um, we already mentioned that large context models are very important. So we uh, saw uh, quite a, 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 a small avalanche of large context papers uh, come out. Obviously, uh, prompt budget is very uh, precious these days. It's kind of the, uh, the CPU cache of the modern uh, application. Definitely. And we see a lot of papers and work from Meta doing uh, on this exact uh, field. Uh, in this specific paper, which got a lot of fuzz on, on Twitter, for example, they, they said that um, one of the main findings actually is you don't really need these long sequences from the beginning of your pre-training. You just need to be very smart on how you extend a model after you have a, a solid uh, ground. Right, the kind of curriculum training in some exactly. sense, right? Yeah. From, from shorter to longer sequences. Yeah, and they show that first, uh, obviously, as you'd expect, when you train a model longer, if it hasn't reached its peak potential, is that it gets even better at other tasks that don't involve these long sequences. Yeah. But you can also use uh, a generative model to create these artificially. So one trick they did was take a long document, find a chunk and ask a question about it, and then reformulate this whole thing as a question uh, answering from a long context. And this is how they create synthetic data and kind of... Uh, and I think one of the tricks here is uh, that they do a slight tweak to the position embedding. They do, right? they do. Uh, they have, these rotary embeddings and they just change a little bit the the uh, uh, the, the, the scaling, the, the that scaling factor with, there. For the yeah. rotation, yeah. yeah. And they also show that uh, kind of similar to the original work of uh, okay, just continuing training, they find that even starting with longer sequences might actually harm. And maybe it's, it's better spending your initial compute budget in uh, very short sequences that a model can see and master yeah. first. Don't don't read Dostoevsky to your toddler. <laughs> uh, and a lot more. I don't think we have time to go into all of them, but uh, Long Laura. Yeah, we have uh, papers like Long That's Laura. That's an adapter, adapter based approach, right? Uh, yeah, they just fine tune a model to work with longer sequences. And they also do this kind of smart uh, shifting of the attention matrices to uh, broaden the information flow over time. And for your, they uh, base their calculations and uh, on mathematical foundation to take even more advantage of these rotary embeddings and how they work and how they're optimally extended to further contexts. Yeah, so should people who are um, developing, and there there was this, uh, is, is yet another one? This is a, yet another from Meta, and yeah. actually this kind of lays the groundwork for another paper that's coming up next, which is uh, let's sparsify the attention matrix. And a key factor from this is that attention kind of likes to attend the first few tokens in your inputs. Mm. And this is kind of almost a month ago, a month old paper. Uh, but just this week, the, we saw this paper from with the attention sinks is what they call, uh, again, based on the same uh, principle that attention, because of the softmax operation, it kind of is forced to attend to some part of the input, even if it's not as important. Mm -hmm. So they actually take advantage of this and say, okay, since we have to do this, Let's create some tokens in the beginning that you kind of offload all your inf semantic information on yeah. without actually there being any. Yeah, kind of a long-term memory uh, for the attention. Yeah, and then you can kind of skip the full attention uh, and only keep it uh, on a sliding window to, 
to yeah. facilitate and longer. And this paper context. actually uh, does not only facilitate longer context, but infinite context as well, right? In principle, yes. In principle, you can just keep streaming. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So uh, I think people who are building applications with 16K context in mind uh, can uh, think that uh, probably in a few months we'll have infinite context. We'll be here to or see that. Or at least very <laughs> large. <laughs> not uh, out of the lab yet um last few papers uh, uh this is actually a data set paper which came out um uh, i think last week as well uh so if you um, thought uh, robocat from deepmind was cool um because it um, generalizes across uh i think six different robot arm embodiments um here in this paper uh, almost 200 researchers from 34 labs pulled together all their robot training data from 22 different embodiments, uh, standardized the format, and uh, open sourced all of that under the Creative Commons license. Uh, it's a couple of terabytes of, uh, of training data. And uh, yeah, it's open source. Uh, you cannot download it. You have to send them an email. So I, I think they're keeping some tabs on, on who uh, who can benefit from it or not. And on on Twitter is being termed the ImageNet moment for robotics. Well, that's maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but it's certainly a big deal, uh, right? The, the lack of training data was one of always one of the big bottlenecks for uh, robotics research. And in fact, in this paper, they do train also a uh, model on this data, the RTX model. And in this graph here, you can see uh, that with the, uh, the rainbow colored uh, uh, bars that it outperforms uh, sort of all the previous models which have not been trained on these different embodiments. So there's a very good kind of transfer across these different embodiments and uh, skills and tasks. And very cool in the paper is that they actually do a lot of this uh, training kind of remotely. So the data sits in one lab and the robot is operated in another lab. So you also have this like, does it generalize well from from kind of from the data set to actual motor control? And the last one is uh, the, uh, go back to uh, Meta, the the EMU paper, which does the image generation. It's uh, not a super uh, um, like a big difference from uh, diffu uh, normal diffusion models for, for image generation. I think it's very similar to the work by uh, uh, stability. Um, but it's kind of same as the textbooks are all you need mm -hmm. paper. They basically um, take a very large uh, a diffusion model and then they uh, manually pick just a very small amount of high quality examples to fine tune on. So here uh, with um, 2000 examples of images that are highly aesthetic, according to purely uh, subjective human judgment, uh, they are able to fine tune this model and, uh, and beat the recent SDXL model by a wide margin. And apparently it's already been uh, operationalized it's in products uh, like Messenger and WhatsApp, but not in Europe. I could not find it. I'm not sure if it's uh, an A-B test or, or not, but people online have already started seeing the results of uh, this in the products of Meta, uh, not always for good reasons. Uh, for example, in the AI stickers that are uh, <laughs> becoming a, a true meme online. Uh, so you can type anything and get a sticker, right, mm -hmm. for your for your chat, <laughs> which I'm sure has many nice applications if you want to chat with friends, but also can be potentially harmful or given to the wrong audience. Yeah. So here uh, on the screen, you see a few examples like Vailuji with a rifle, uh, Karl Marx with large breasts. Uh, but um, go online; there are much, <laughs> much, uh, much more uh, interesting ones uh, to find. So a bit of uh, uh, um, alignment is still needed mm -hmm. for these models, um, but very cool that they released it so quickly. So um, yeah, uh, enormous amount of things that happened. Remember that uh, six months ago, uh, Elon Musk called for a pause on AI. I don't think that has exactly uh, happened. Um, so, 
uh, Wired did an article on this, and um, uh, the conclusion was it has really only accelerated. Uh, so we asked for a pause on AI, or Elon asked for a pause on AI. I'm sure he's still wrapping up the release of his first language model from the XAI uh, team that he founded. But uh, instead, we got um, the pause token in large language models. So there's this paper uh, that came out this week, Think Before You Speak, which uh, shows that if you uh, just at the end of the sequence, you first learn the model, uh, teach the model to uh, to generate a few special pause tokens. It does considerably better. So, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, kind of back to um, ancient wisdom: think twice, speak once. So that was it. Um, thanks for tuning in to uh, Trends in AI. Um, thanks for uh, coming here in live in Lab uh, Forty Two. Uh, what's next? Uh, so next week um, is uh, AI week in Amsterdam and we'll be at the World uh, Summit. In um, uh, It's a big kind of more business and commercial oriented conference on AI in, uh, in the vicinity of Amsterdam. And uh, also next week uh, on uh, uh, Thursday is the launch of um, uh, Nathan Benai in uh, Air Street Capital's a state of AI report, the annual sort of uh, temperature of the whole scene. So uh, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to that. And uh, uh, spoiler alert, we will see some uh, Zeta Alpha research uh, in that. And um, uh, looking a bit further ahead, um, we also expanding our series of neural search talks and we'll be interviewing um, uh, people uh, live from a um, uh, conference in the U.S., uh, Knowledge Management World, Enterprise Search and Discovery. Um, and here in Amsterdam, finally, I uh, want to shout out a very cool uh, workshop that is being organized uh, by um, uh, some of the AI folks here at Lab42 uh, about um, using AI for chemical discovery on uh, November 16th, Chem AI. Check it out. That's it. Um, enjoy discovery.